Welcome to Boom, where we have biomechanics on our minds. Boom. 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 Hello and welcome to Student Voices, a series from the Biomechanics on Our Minds podcast. My name is Michael Rose, and this fall I'll be starting a PhD program in mechanical engineering. As I get ready to start, I wanted to ask a few of my friends who started their PhDs in 2020 how their experience has been so far, how it has been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, and any advice they would give future students. In this episode, three of those conversations will be shared, and I hope you enjoy. Who do I hear? A student is near. Voices. Student voices. 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 Our first guest today is Ophelia Erve. Ophelia and I actually met just days before the pandemic started at UCLA, where she's currently a student in the lab. I'll be joining in the fall, and I'm always super excited to chat with her. So, Ophelia, thanks for being uh, on Boom today. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, can you just give a brief introduction into kind of who you are and uh, about the work you do? Yeah, so as you said, I'm Ophelia. Um, I'm a second year, at the end of my second year, PhD student at UCLA. Uh, I work in the anatomical engineering group under Dr. Tyler Kleitz. Uh, I was started with him as he started at UCLA along with uh, a few other PhD students. and. Are, yeah, so the anatomical engineering group and my research is specifically designing an implant uh, to enhance ACL reconstruction surgery to prevent further ACL injury. So that kind of gives one, uh, one thing that we're working on in the lab um, in addition to a wide variety of different projects. Gotcha. So what challenges did you face as a new student starting at a new university um, when everything was remote and online and specifically like being the first, like one of the first couple of students in a new lab? Yeah, uh, great question. <laughs> uh, so to paint a picture, uh, the pandemic started and, you know, I did start classes online, but I also moved to LA in the mid middle of that. And so in September of 2020, moved to LA, October 2020 is when we started classes. And so I the pandemic definitely impacted my life and uh, my PhD experience that first year because I really did my first year of my PhD in my bedroom to a certain extent. Uh, all of my classes were remote. Um, so that definitely made it challenging just because, you know, I was 23, moved out to a new city, didn't know anybody in the program that I was joining uh, was completely online. And so developing relationships with my peers and my coworkers was definitely a challenge. Um, and yeah, and then you asked about uh, as a first student in the lab, is that correct? Yeah, so I think that also is unique in the sense that not only was I one of three PhD students to begin in Dr. Kleitz's lab, um, that fall, but in addition, we were completely remote. And so even getting our lab started uh, was a challenge in and of itself because we obviously weren't on campus to do any research and it was all remote. Some of that is a good thing because you are focused more on literature review your first year of your PhD in regards to research as you figure out and navigate what your project looks like and, how, and develop that fun foundation of understanding that you need. Uh, but to a certain extent, like even my lab mates, it was definitely a challenge to get to know them over Zoom and things like that. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Are there any specific actions you took to try to either feel more integrated in a new city or to try to cultivate relationships at uh, UCLA? Totally. That Yeah. So I, I will say I am... I love community. I thrive with people. Uh, so sometimes in mechanical engineering, I'm, it can be a challenge because I feel like I'm very, very social. Uh, but I think that's also one of my strong suits. And so when I moved out to LA, especially during the pandemic, you know, I had the expectation that, okay, this is going to be new and this is going to be challenging and I don't know anybody. So I will have to put myself out there. And I mean, with all the challenges I just expressed, like, I was well aware of that and so 
to answer your question, I uh, kind of took it upon myself to initiate that, to take ownership of, okay, if I love communi- community, I feel like I, I, that is one of my strong suits is I feel like I love to create community, but I also feel like I am good at cultivating a space that invites people in and, and creates that community. So I had originally even talked to Tyler, uh, Dr. Kleitz, we call him Tyler, uh, <laughs> Tyler, about this and just said like, hey, I would love to create a culture for this lab from the get-go and really develop a lab that uh, people want to be in and that people feel welcome and accepted and loved and and valued, right? Like that their work is seen and valued and that they're excited to come to lab every day. And Tyler had that vision too. And so I um, I think within, you know, the research space and the 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 lab space that first year, even though we were only three students in Tyler, you know, that was even a, a positive point, right? Because it was already small that we could get to know each other. But in addition to that, I started reaching out to, uh, or just planning different events, right? Planning different things that we could do as a lab, planning uh, hangouts once, obviously once the pandemic, yeah loosened up we like did our first hike and stuff but um in addition to that you know when we were still completely online I would initiate like coffee zooms with the other students and just try to get to know them because you know these other PhD students that started with me like they're not only my coworker, but they become my friend they've become my friend and because we are spending the next five years together Uh, and so it definitely is like I took it upon myself to really initiate those relationships. Um, so you mentioned earlier the uh, impact of being online, starting your research, and it was okay at first as it was a mostly literature, but how has the pandemic for the past two years, how have you felt that's impacted your research even when you're able to return to the lab? Yeah, so great question. Uh, it definitely, I mean, you can't do research in your bedroom. Let's put it like that. Uh, so especially my, our research is, is focused on, um, like we work with cadaver, like cadavers. So I work with cadaver knees. I work with a KUKA robot. I work, we have a dissection space. So a lot of what we do is hands-on, um, which means that you know, you can't take dead legs home with you into your bedroom. Like, there's just a limit to what you can do remotely. So, with that being said, I, yeah, as you said, like, I think my project was unique in that Tyler and I um, really started my project from together. And so, it, it really has been, I've watched it from its infancy, which means that that first year I did spend quite a bit of time, one, getting my feet settled in California in the new program, because you do take a lot of classes your first year. Uh, But in addition to that, just gaining the literature knowledge, reading a ton to get an understanding of this space, which is common for any first year PhD student as they enter into a project, you have to develop that fundamental understanding of it. Um, But once you get past the literature review, then it is, okay, I need to start doing hands-on things, I, and I need more, even hands-on training, some of the different softwares that might not be like needing a robot in front of you, but you need more teaching or, and some of that is just hard to do on Zoom. I remember Tyler, some of my, I remember in the, the winter quarter of my first year spending hours on zoom with tyler as he was trying to teach me open sim and the thing would crash and then we'd have to start a new zoom like and his patience is something that i'll be forever grateful for but it is like those were definitely challenging times um and yeah and so it definitely impacted i feel like my progress because all of that was just stunted or just seemed to take so much longer than had I been in lab where people are around where I can ask questions um, quickly rather than having to set up a Zoom call and like maybe you're not free until later. Um, So it definitely, I think, stunted progress for me as well as I would imagine all students who experienced the pandemic. Yeah. 
Thanks for sharing that story also about uh, you and Dr. Clayton Open Sim. We do like to to humanize failure in, uh, on Boom, and so that's, I think, a great story and hopefully something that you'll, you'll have fun looking back at when we're hopefully out of the pandemic and it's like, oh, yeah, back when I was there, the Zoom calls were yeah. crashing and Open Sim was failing. Oh, 100%. I have many stories of that from my first year. <laughs> well, like you mentioned, your... Your first year was basically from your bedroom. How did you manage like mm -hmm. work-life balance, being new to a new city and basically existing like, you know, your house was your work, it was your leisure, it was your, you know, where you mm -hmm. lived, where you ate. How did you manage work-life balance when like all those normally different physical spaces were all one? I can tell you I did not do it perfectly and it was definitely a learning curve. Uh, yeah, I mean, it is something that I gradually learned and I think as I became more aware of the impact COVID was having on me because at first, you know, I was excited to be in a new city. There was so much new, even though I was like in my bedroom, it was still, I was in a new space, it was exciting. But yeah, as the first year went on and classes went on, there were moments where I was like rolling out of bed, rolling to my desk that's next to my bed, working eating, kind of staying alive, rolling back into bed, and definitely my mental health, uh, I think, I mean, yeah, vulnerably, and like everybody I think had a moment of this in COVID is like, there was a moment where things did not look good, uh, and it was a hard time, and so to answer your question, I think first thing I did was talk to people about it. I think oftentimes we can feel alone, and I think with COVID, everyone felt alone in it and to a certain extent, but as people started being more vulnerable and communicating the challenges, um, there was a lot of support uh, for me and for others. And so, but some of the things that I specifically did uh, was carve out time and give myself margin. Um, specifically, when you're home all the time, it you have to almost have like a schedule of like, no, I'm only going to work these hours, and then I, and and also create spaces that are work zones, and then not work zone so like kitchen is for eating and you know this side of my room is my bed and this side of my room is is work uh so kind of creating time and then also I think the biggest thing for me was finding hobbies and finding things that kind of took me away took my mind off of work uh and so whether that was um I like I love to sing and so started making more time for that, started learning instruments that I could do and really creating time for things that got my mind off of work. And uh, I love working out and that also is really helpful to just, especially when we're in the, when we were in COVID and you know, we're at home and sitting all day, it really was important for me to make sure that I was prioritizing my physical health to get outside to, because when I felt well in my body, I was able to, to mentally feel better, mentally be more focused even uh, on work when I was working. And so kind of, I think about it in, uh, basically I try to think about it in physical health um, and then mental health is like, what am I doing to, to stay happy, right? So these other hobbies that I have of singing and then like social health, I think it was really important for me, kind of my first point of sharing with others, communicating with others, I really, decided okay you know I can't see anybody but I like we have so much technology now like FaceTiming I started making sure that I was you know having FaceTimes with my family consistently calling friends from back home you know that I left to come to California but just making sure that my relationships and my friendships were being tended to and cared for um, and then that even further uh, motivated me to continue developing relationships with the people in my lab as well as trying to make relationships with people that were in my classes on Zoom. You know, I'd be the weird one that chats on Zoom and is like, you're the only other person that doesn't have their screen on black, so you seem friendly. Let's be friends. Um, and so, but just like putting yourself out there, but also really taking time to make sure that I was spending time with people uh, that I cared for and that we were having conversations outside of lab. Um, and then also as a grad student, I think I was lucky that my roommate uh, is not in grad school. And I 
that's kind of weird but to say, but I think that was actually really helpful my first year because when I was home all the time, it was really helpful to kind of like be with someone who did have a nine to five job, you know, and, and wasn't part of grad school. So it also kind of removed me a little bit from the stress and the narrow head, like the narrow mindedness that we can sometimes get or the tunnel vision that we have as grad students of like, this is all of our life to have someone who's kind of like, hey, like come hang out with me and like, let's go watch a movie tonight or something or just have dinner with, yeah. you know, that was really helpful too. Gotcha. So I have a couple questions left. Uh, the first one is how did you manage mm-hmm. school and work expectations um, that you had for yourself or that others had for you during your first two years? A lot of grace, <laughs> a lot of grace. I um, am, if, if you're familiar with the Enneagram, which not many people are, but Okay, if you, you should look into it because I'm obsessed with it. But I'm a three and all of that means, it's like a personality test and that's the achiever. So I have it in me to always be setting goals for myself, just always wanting to achieve so much. I have super huge dreams for my life and for myself. And that also comes with, it's a virtue and a vice because that also means I'm incredibly hard on myself and can be quite self-critical if I don't meet these extravagant unrealistic (laughs) goals that I set for myself um so I've and I feel like I've grown so much in understanding that through the PhD which I'm really thankful for because it's helped me realize you know when I started the PhD um you know you can dream about these projects like our projects in this lab are super innovative and uh kind of you know I'm trying to think of the best word, but I mean, they're revolutionizing the field. They're, they're really exciting, but they've also never been done before. So they are exciting and we can hear that we can see the vision, but sometimes it's like as a starting PhD student, I'm like, Oh my gosh, that's so cool. But then you start and you're like, wow, this is like five years away to actually being done. Um, and so I think those first two years yeah I just set such high expectations such high goals for myself and I wanted to do so much and I felt the burden and became really hard on myself when I saw things were not my expectations were not getting met my deadlines and timelines were not getting met everything took so much longer than I expected and that was really a huge learning curve for me I really realized I think I just learned the nature of research to a certain extent is that research takes long and you it never takes the time you think it's going to take and it's it's a journey and so you have to have grace over yourself that you have to to continuously say you know I'm learning I'm still learning there's so much for me to learn um and I've really adopted that perspective more so in the last I feel like six months to a year the second year really is like learning hey, I, I have these high goals and that's a good thing, but knowing that like the accomplishment is the journey, not the end result, right? Like I'm learning so much every day and I have to take in those little wins to keep me motivated. Um, so, but yeah, grace is the only way to get through the PhD. Uh, that, this is a little bit to the last question actually, um, which is yeah. loaded kind of like, the other questions but if you could go back in time to two years ago what advice would you tell yourself and what advice would you give I don't know maybe like someone else who might be starting a PhD in the fall possibly also in your lab (laughs) oh I wonder who (laughs) um so yeah great question um I think it kind of goes along with what I just said but I think oftentimes we hmm. I guess what I would say is to realize that you're here to learn Uh, I think in our culture just yeah in our culture in general success is held so highly you know accomplish things like make it and so I think in some ways the PhD you know I got here and I was like okay I have to like prove that I deserve to be here I I have to prove that I can do this and I think I maybe I personally maybe took it more of like this is a job that I have to perform at 
Um, and so I don't know if other PhD students have that feeling sometimes when, or may have that feeling as they start, but I think my biggest advice to myself looking back and to any PhD student that's starting in the lab uh, at Michael <laughs> is, is to have that mentality that you're here to learn. You're here to make mistakes. You're here because you don't know how to do what you're about to do. And, and there are people that want to support you and want to help you succeed. Um, and again, I think redefining what success looks like. Success is not, I think research in of itself is like a huge lesson on that for me is learning patience because it takes a long time. But then two, to learn that success isn't, you know, the perfect result or the expected results or, uh, but success is like learning as you go, uh, taking in those lessons and, uh, and really just valuing the time that you're here because I think so often also in higher academia, it's like, oh, I'm here to get a PhD and leave. You know, I'm just here to get a certificate. I'm here to get the degree so that I can go get a better job. And <clears throat> I'm like a firm believer that you're exactly where you need to be. And so I think something that I wish I'd realized earlier on, like I think I've realized this now and I'm actively uh, you know, living by this, but I think I wish I would have told my, you know, learned this earlier on, is to realize you're exactly where you need you need to be, and you're not, you don't need to rush out of this, and like really taking every day as a gift, right? Like I'm here. These are the people I'm supposed to be interacting with today. These are this is what I'm working on today. I'm gonna be fully present, fully focused here. I'm gonna learn everything I can. Um, and not, not wish these next five years to just fly by, you know, because I think there is something sweet about this time in your life of like, I mean, I'm in my mid, like 25, you know, so it's your sweet 20s and you're figuring life out and you have to extend grace towards yourself, but also just sit and realize like, I'm here for a reason and I'm going to, to actively contribute in every way I can, um, but not wish these five years away. Even even when there's a pandemic, don't yeah. wish it away. Yeah. Um, awesome. So, that. yeah, being present, yeah. That's awesome. Ahead. Thank you for that. I, I really enjoyed the, the first point about, like, I, you're there to learn. Because in my young research career mm -hmm. so far, the times where I've, like, felt the worst and, like, struggled the most was also the times that I was learning the most. Uh, and yeah. I hopefully keep that, keep that mentality and that attitude when I start that even if things are challenging, even if the, the success isn't coming, mm -hmm. the learning is there. Well, yeah, I think to that point exactly is like the last two years, the hardest moments that I've had research wise where I've just been like hitting my head against a wall and like I literally thinking like I can't do this. I I want to quit, you know, because you have those moments, to be honest, any PhD student, if they're being real with you, they have had that moment where they're like, I want to quit. Um, but looking back over the last two years, those breaking points for me have always been the moments, as you said, the like man, I look back and I'm like, yeah, I learned the most research-wise, but also just life-wise. I think um, there's a lot of life lessons that I've learned in the PhD that I hope I've communicated some of them, but it's it's a rich time. Awesome. Well, sure. thank you for joining me today for another great conversation and for taking time to be on Boom. Thank you so much for having me. Who do I hear? Voices. Student is near. Voices. Student. Voices. 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 Our second guest today is Gabby Diaz. Gabby and I also met shortly before the pandemic started at the University of Colorado Boulder, where she's a grad student, and we had very similar research interests, so always great to catch up and uh, hear what you're doing. Gabby, thanks for being on Boom today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, can you just give a brief introduction or brief overview of who you are and what you do? Yeah, so my name is Gabby, and I work in the Applied Biomechanics Lab at CU Boulder, which is uh, ran by Dr. Lena Grabowski. And our lab overall studies um, and looks at the effects of mechanical devices such as lower limb prostheses and exoskeleton on biomechanics and metabolics. And I'm specifically really looking at improving socket fit for um, both transtibial and transfemoral amputees 
to testing some novel sockets and hopefully using that to design some new sockets to help improve any amputees with walking. That's awesome. Um, just to start off with, as a new student in Boulder, what challenges did you face starting a new university and being in a new city when everything was in the middle of lockdown, everything was remote, things like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, not the best time to move across the country, but uh, came here from North Carolina and I think I was pretty lucky in the fact that I was moving to such an outdoorsy city. Um, so there was a lot to do in terms of the outdoors here, but starting grad school was uh, a little bit challenging. I uh, was pretty burnt out coming straight from undergrad in, right into grad school and then having everything be virtual. Took some, took some adjusting and trying to reshape my mind of what I was expecting when starting a new school. Um, but I really just had to try and virtually meet as many people as I can so that we can all like use the Zoom chat in class to keep ourselves <laughs> entertained and you know send messages over video, try not to get caught, to try and keep any entertainment during class because after doing four years of undergrad and my, the end of my senior year was all you know canceled by COVID. Um, I was not looking forward to the virtual format. So just trying to keep myself entertained and make it through the classes and take what I needed out of them. Um, but yeah, it was a lot of virtual online meeting people and trying to make those connections. Mm -hmm. And actually, just before we started recording, we were talking about um, the event that CU through where we met was uh, an event for prospective students. It was like 60 or so people with Mm -hmm. Many of whom went to see you. Did you still keep in touch with? How important were those connections that you had made just before the onset of the pandemic in your first year and even still? Oh, those are so pivotal. Like, that was honestly a big factor in me choosing CU. Um, I came out for the visit and got to meet so many cool people. You include Michael. <laughs> and when I got to Boulder, uh, all of our group chats just started blowing up from gears again and being like, who's here, who came? And being like, hey, do you wanna go and float down the river from six feet apart with each other, go on a hike with our masks on? Um, and so since I had those connections previously, that really helped kind of keep those going. And I was very lucky in the sense that I met my roommate at Gears. Um, he reached out to me throughout the whole process. We were kind of going back and forth on if he was, we were both gonna end up here. And so I was able to live with a person that I had met before and was in our same department. So he was going through the same things we were, or I was. Um, so I was super helpful. And honestly, those connections that I made at Gears are the ones that are still getting me through grad school today. Uh, seeing those people every day, no matter how much we see each other, um, can't get sick of them. So yeah. thankfully I had those and we just kept doing outdoorsy things trying to keep our bubble to 10 people at the beginning and then slowly started expanding once we could. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, thank God for the visits and all of those connections I was able to make before. Yeah, that's awesome. I love seeing you guys all still being together and posting pictures. Mm -hmm. um, how did the pandemic impact your research or your ability to do research throughout your first two years? Yeah, so the... A weird fact that I like to think about sometimes is that I moved out here in July and I didn't see my advisor, Lena, until June the next year in person. <laughs> I, we were able to slowly start getting back into the lab in little pods. Um, Alina had kind of split us up into groups to have two or three people in um, the lab at a time, but I was never able to really meet everybody for a second time after my visit until the summer when we were indoors masked. Um, so it was really challenging to kind of move research at the pace that I was hoping to. Um, I got very lucky in the sense that a graduating student had a data set collected, but unanalyzed. Um, and so I did a lot of virtual training with uh, Ryan in our lab, who's um, now moved on to Apple. He had this large data set and was able to train me and start teaching me the tips and tricks all remotely. Um, but I was doing very similar work, I felt like, to what I was doing at, as an undergrad because that was what was left was the digitizing and the training. And so it, it took 
way longer than I expected until I felt like, oh, I'm a grad student now. Like I'm doing my own research. I was taking on somebody else's project as much as it was a blessing in the time is not kind of how I anticipated coming into grad school. Um, but I was able to slowly start building the like basic learning blocks that for my own projects that I would use in the future. Um, but it was slow, slow going. <laughs> yeah. And your research also seems like the end goal is to be implemented in humans, but how did you get any, did you run into any roadblocks on the way of like not being able to bring in human subjects or test on, on human participants? Yeah, and that's something that our lab I think is still um, struggling with, it's just the, the fallout effects of um, not having human subject in for a while, maybe losing some of our uh, connections with contacts that we had that were in the lab more regularly. Um, and so, yeah, all of our data collections stopped. And for the nature of our research, everybody should be, we should have our lab packed as much as we can. Um, and it was just quiet and a lot of going through old data. So our own research definitely slowed and just trying to make do with what we already had. Mm -hmm. Were you able to learn any lessons from going through the data, even when like you might not have been able to be doing the research or collecting the data yourself that that help you now that you're two years in oh absolutely um i probably since i spent so much time with the data probably more than i would have if i had been like collecting and then just quickly analyzing the data i got to really like deep dive into my data and spend a lot of time relearning the basic uh, learning blocks of biomechanical analysis like Instead of just doing the process, which I probably would have just running the pipelines before, I'm like, hmm, I have time because I have nothing else <laughs> to analyze. Like, what does this button do in visual 3D? And um, what if I try cleaning my data using these pipelines instead? And so I got to really dive into what I was doing and why I was doing it mm -hmm. since I had one thing to do. <laughs> yeah. And hopefully that leads to you running better experiments now in the future. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of stuff that I've taken from looking at data that I didn't collect and be like, oh, I, I want to do this, or oh, maybe mm -hmm. I, sh I should make sure that I write down this in the future, double check gains and force plates, because I, when I find errors. Um, so definitely help me think um, to plan my studies. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And just transitioning a bit now to life outside of the lab, what uh, activities or habits, I know you talked about being outside, um, did you develop for your mental health to deal with stress starting a new program and doing it during the, the uh, onset of the pandemic? Uh, yeah, since since it's Colorado, I have to give you the basic Colorado answer of hiking and backpacking. Um, so I took up snowboarding, which has been a blast. Um, so really just getting outside and disconnecting from my work as much as I can. I really tried um, when I was in a lot of classes and uh, doing all this data analysis to try and take the weekends off as much as I'm like, oh, I'd kind of want to push through and work on this, like make sure I have at least one long hike planned during the week mm. and doing it with friends. Like I, like you mentioned, the people that I met at Gears, um, we've kind of formed our own little CU mechanical engineering uh, little family. And so meeting up with those people, going to a brewery, playing cards, Mm -hmm. And hiking has been a lifesaver. Mm -hmm. What is your favorite, like, off the beaten path trail to hike? Mm. Off the beaten path? I don't know. I really like. It's like a. I feel a pretty basic answer for people that like know Rocky Mountain, but Sky Pond is a like beautiful hike. That I love anything that was water because there's not enough water in Colorado. So whenever I see water, I get excited. Um, there's a really cool hike in Rocky Mountain National Park called Sky Pond where you hike up. Um, you have to climb up a little bit of a waterfall at a point and you end up at a really beautiful lake in the middle of the mountains, um, which is great. And then in Boulder, only like 10 minutes from my house is um, Sinitas Mountains. So that's so nice to have so close in the summers. I'll go and hike in the morning and still be in work by 9 a.m. Wow. Um, so it's, it's a really nice place to be doing my PhD. <laughs> And how did you uh, handle work-life balance? I know you just mentioned um, trying to make sure you take the weekends off, but how did you manage work-life balance during the, the early pandemic? Um, honestly, it was hard to. <laughs> uh, 
it was a lot when we couldn't go outside or couldn't see people it was really easy to like get sucked in to the work um but just hanging out with my roommates watching tv uh, telling myself it's okay to spend a whole day like binging tv with my roommates on the weekend like um just trying to disconnect as much as possible and make connections with other people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How did you manage expectations that you had for yourself during the first two years, both like in school and in research? Uh, again, that, that was challenging. I think, I don't know if it was because of, yeah, I'm going to give some of it to COVID, um, the fact that like things were moving so slow, but I came in with the research bug. Like I really enjoyed my undergrad research experience and that's what like led me to do grad school. And I was working with grad students, so I saw them cranking out work and cranking out papers. I was like, yeah, I'm going to go do that, and I'm going to be so smart, and I'm going to do all this really cool work. And then I got here, and I had to TA, and I had to take all these online classes, and I had to figure out my own data analysis, and it went so slow. And I'm like, wow, I suck. <laughs> um, but then I, I, through talking with other people and realizing that's just the nature of getting started, um, and really just had to give myself a lot of grace and keep reminding myself that like I'm not running a race right now I can take my time and try and just slow these things down and realize okay even though my research is going really slow right now I'm taking classes like I'm finishing my degree um, I was teaching a class so I'm helping other people and there will be a time where I'm not doing any of that and I can dive into my own research and move at a faster pace. Mm -hmm. So I just have to keep reminding myself that it's just the beginning. Yeah. I love that answer as well because giving yourself grace was actually a topic in the answer of the last guest as well um, for this question on expectations. So happy to have that little theme going. I imagine it's hard yeah. also, like you mentioned, <laughs> moving to a new place, like physically being there, but then virtually doing all your classes to feel actually integrated in the program. Yeah, I live one mile from my lab. Like, I, if I squint down a foot on the street, I can see my lab, and I never went in. <laughs> and so it was really weird to be this close and to, like, meet all the lab mates online but not really know them yet. Um, so it, it, was, it was a weird transition, but thankfully things are getting back to normal now. Yeah. And just to uh, finish up, if you could go back in time two years ago, what advice would you give yourself starting your program? And what advice would you give to a student now in 2022 that may be starting their PhD in the fall? I think my advice would be that don't try and rush things. Like, let it, let things move the way that they're moving. And like I said earlier, yeah, just that grace and understand that there's a lot going on. And if things aren't moving as fast as you want them, that's okay. Um, another big piece of advice, I think, uh, for new people coming into programs is to be okay with change. Things are not going to go the way that you expect them to. And if you keep trying to push so hard to make things work, um, it may not always work. So be open and willing to change. I've had a lot of friends switch labs um, and or switch projects um, just because and I, I'm switching gears in terms of projects. I didn't think I would be working on prosthetic sockets. But now I'm super excited about this project. I just came in with such a strict idea of what I wanted to do, and that hasn't worked out. And I was probably a little too bummed about it at first, but now I'm super excited. So you just have to be like willing to go with the flow. And if things aren't working, change it. Advocate for yourself. Learn how to tell other people things aren't going how you expect it, and you want something to change. Gotcha. Awesome. Well, thank you for the conversation, Gabby. It was uh, great having you on Boom today. Thank you. Yeah, it was good seeing you again. Who do I hear? Voices. Student is near. Voices. Student. Voices. 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 And with our third interview, uh, today I'm talking to Garrett Weidig. Garrett and I actually go all the way back to first grade. We grew up together. Uh, went to school together up until college, ended up going different ways, but both found our ways into biomechanics. Uh, and I'm super excited to have Garrett as the third guest on the podcast today. 
Um, Garrett, why don't you give a little bit of background on just what you do right now um, and what you do for work? Thanks for the introduction, Michael. Really appreciate being here with one of my longest friends, and it's just wonderful to be on, a, on the podcast. Um, yeah, so a little bit of what I do. Um, I essentially evaluate uh, octopus movements. Um, I've been working on redefining their movements, and the end goal of that is to be able to implement these movements and these definitions into uh, upper extremity uh, biomechanics. Specifically, we're looking to um, create better upper extremity prosthetics, and we think that a prosthetic modeled after the octopus arm uh, is pretty much a great fit for um, for device design. So yeah, that's basically what I what I'm up to. I study human reach and grasp as well to sort of fit in to try to figure out where the octopus arm would fit into that planning. Um, but my biggest work and my most novel work is on the front of octopus movement definitions. Cool. And uh, where do you do that? I do that at Michigan State University under Dr. Tamara Reed Bush. Um, yeah, our whole lab focuses on rehabilitation uh, and device design. So we have people who work on seating all the way up to posture. Um, we have people who work with uh, the uh, with hand OA, thumb OA, and then all the way up to prosthetic work. And another reason you're a unique guest on the podcast is you stayed in the same lab for undergrad and PhD, but your project and your work is very different now. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I started um, out, I was a junior and I was just looking for some research experience. So I joined the lab. Um, I had Dr. Bush as a professor, so I was really interested in her work. When I started in the lab, I was working under an undergrad who I'm a coworker of now, and she was working on seating mechanics, um, evaluating different postures, ergonomics. Um, and then when I started my PhD, that was all about uh, this whole new project. Gotcha. So being in the same lab, how were the challenges you faced and, and how was it when the uh, pandemic and the lockdown initially happened, being that you were staying in the same place with like similar mentor and, and colleagues? It was, it was both good and bad. I, I would say that the advantage was that I didn't have any awkward phase. I was still dealing with the same people that I knew. Um, lab meetings still felt very familial um, and familiar. Uh, we were all very, I would say we were pretty close. Um, uh, so I didn't have the disadvantage of being like the newcomer, didn't know anybody. Um, but it, it was also weird in that I wasn't able um, that we were we didn't have the same types of relationships like we couldn't express our relationships the same way um, working together uh, I wanted to be able to maintain that same sort of solidarity helping each other out really easily but when communication drops off like that it's really difficult to stay in touch up to date on everybody's projects mm -hmm. it wasn't really until after the pandemic started to calm down we were back in the office was I able to get like a true understanding of what everybody was working on. And I realized, you know, once I started giving presentations to people again, they were like, oh yeah, I didn't know you were doing that. Or I didn't know you did that in the off time. And it was like, oh yeah, like, why would you? We don't see each other every day. We're not doing all this stuff. But um, it was good to be on the same level, but also it, <clears throat> I wanted it to be, I knew what it could be and I knew that it wasn't that. And so part of it was disappointing, but was still able to get the, the advantages out of it. Yeah, like when you're not physically rubbing shoulders with people and, and having those easy work conversations. How did the exactly. uh, lockdown affect your research? Uh, well, we deal with a lot of, um, like I said, I deal with octopuses and our, our overall lab, the, Dr. Bush's overall lab goal is to focus on humans. And so when we do human experiments, and we have to go through an institutional review board or your IRB. It can, it, for a while, they were shutting down a lot of the research projects that were happening. No human subject testing if you had to maintain a certain amount of contact over time. So I would say for me, it just delayed the start of me understanding the human aspect of things because that, that was something I was interested in, but I, I wasn't necessarily explicitly exploring during that time. So I actually saw my coworkers, my lab mates go through it a lot more and that they weren't able to recruit for their studies as heavily or they had to be really careful who they were recruiting if they were able to do that at all. Um, for me, I just had to kind of watch from the outside and say like, oh, okay, this is something that I won't be able to explore for a while. Um, but when it comes to the octopuses too, that is that was a huge struggle because 
even today, the, the whole supply chain thing is still a problem. Back then, it was even worse, and where they people are delivering live specimen of octopuses across the country, um, and so they can delay the research a lot and the the health of the octopus and everything like that. So, um, from the human side, it delayed it, but from the octopus side, it it kind of killed it uh, in some aspects. Also, we sorry, not killed the <laughs> octopus. I should mention that. The but it just it just really slowed things down. Um, also, it was the beginning of the grant. We were getting new equipment. A lot of that equipment came from overseas, um, and that was just slowed down to a, a ridiculously slow rate. Um, so I think I started getting my funding in um, early summer of 2020, and I really didn't feel like I was truly working on the project with equipment for the project until later that year. So, yeah, it just slowed things down. Yeah, I got you. And you also mentioned being frustrated. I do want to touch on mental health uh, in the early pandemic and the lockdown. Um, how did that feel in the beginning? Being a new student, was it difficult almost? Like, did you feel like you weren't making progress as you expected to uh, coming into a new program? Yeah. Do, are you specifically talking about like the research or academics or both? You can touch on both. Yeah. So I there's definitely the struggle of, we all have the struggle of balancing classes and research. And I think there was a lot of, I felt a lot of pressure. I wanted to do, I wanted to mostly focus on the research aspect, right? Because that's what I'm, that's what I feel like I'm getting paid to do. Even though my classes are being covered, I really feel like I'm being paid to do the research. Um, and I wanted to do really well in it. And it's a really exciting project. So any opportunity I had to kind of go after the research aspect, I would, hyper fixate on that. And um, I think that's something regardless of the pandemic that it is always present. We're always kind of struggling with the, the school or the, the academics or the research. But on top of that, um, I think that being at home, you're not always exposed to research when you're just working from home all the time, right? So you're not always in the mood to be doing the research that you want to be doing, or if you're at home, you don't necessarily want to be focusing on the academics as you might well want to. But when you that you have that separation of oh, you're not going into work to really focus on the research, you feel like any opportunity you get to do the research, you have to put even more effort into doing that from home or going into the office and doing it uh, with a mask, and you, you have to comply with all these things. So it, it even just preparing to do the research really takes out of a chunk takes out a chunk of the confidence or the ability to do the academic part of things. And I think that is where a lot of the anxiety grew and that I wanted to be doing, wanted to be doing well in my classes, but there was a lot more pressure. I put a lot more pressure on myself to be doing the research, making sure that gets done. Um, and then there's the whole added aspect of going to class with your classmates who you don't really know because it's your first year and you don't know necessarily know everybody in your program. And having your uh, de deciding whether or not to have your camera on is a, a decision that gives you anxiety, right? Because you're just sitting there like, oh, no one else has their camera on, so I'm not going to turn on mine. Um, and that has a long-term effect. Right now, I see people who were in my class two years ago, and I would have never known had you know they had I not talked to them about being in that class, right? So, um, yeah, that's a that's a big big aspect. Yeah. You're sitting at home with a sweatshirt on, and all you know is their name. <laughs> Yeah, and, and definitely, exactly. And so if you're not, a, if you don't feel immersed in that learning scope, or you don't feel in that, like you're in that environment, it can be really difficult to switch from your home life to your work life. And I know it's a big problem. You're, you're not supposed to work in the same place that you do, you know, your, your daily activities and your yeah. leisure. Yeah. But uh, you have no option when you feel limited going into work. Mm -hmm. So. You mentioned anxiety over not progressing in research. How did you both handle expectations and manage setting expectations for yourself uh, in the beginning of your program? Yeah, in the beginning it was tough because we would make schedules. Um, we would try to s stick by them. I was doing a lot of reading. Um, and I, I feel like it's kind of going to skip to the, the good part, but I feel like I didn't really start to get into a groove until we were at least allowed to go back into the office where I felt like I could set, I could visualize my workspace a lot better. 
I could say, you know, today I'm going to spend time physically in the lab, or today I'm going to siphon off my time to be in uh, the office and then do some analysis, whatever that's going to be, or whatever that entails. But whenever I was working at home, I found it really difficult to divide up my day into the, to, to achieve the tasks that I wanted to achieve that day. Sometimes I got to go out and buy supplies to do an experiment. Um, and when I'm already out going to the office, that feels like a really fluid thing to do. I just stop by, stop by Joanne's on the way home from work, get whatever materials I need to do, whatever experiment, and then go on with my day. But when I found myself at home, I found it really difficult to parse off my time into like, oh, well, I can go to Joanne's anytime. I can, I can go to the store. It, it's no big deal. I can go anytime. And then I would put it off. I'd put it off until the end of the day, or then it wouldn't happen. And then I would say, oh, well, next time I go out, you know, I'll, I'll do that. So it, for a while, I didn't cope with it. It was just very not fluid. I was, I was at, my, at this desk and doing whatever I felt like I could get done. But a lot of the things that required me to go out of this workspace didn't, didn't get done in the manner that they wanted. So for a while, they didn't get done. But I, I started to make checklists, things that I, I knew I could do. Um, I could, things that I knew I could spend a decent amount of time outside of the house doing and putting those in a checklist and getting those done. So if I had to make a trip to the store and go to work, then I would put that in the same bin. Um, I started making more excuses to actually go into the office because I think for oh, a good while, excuses, healthy we, excuses. Yeah. yeah I, and, and that's, that, that sounds kind of weird, right? Because we don't think about, that's not how you would imagine. Oh, I need an excuse to go into work. But during COVID, you know, when, when you had to mask up and you wanted to make sure everyone's safe, you kind of had to make an excuse for, oh, this is what I'm going to get done in the office. And honestly, I could have totally gotten it done at home, but it was the fact that home was bogging down so much of my time and I wasn't really working as efficiently at home that it made sense to start making work an excuse to go in and actually do it versus working remotely. So I think that was the biggest thing, like trying to organize my time into what can be done at home what can be done at work what should what should be done at work what could be done at both but i'm going to still choose to bin it in one of these categories and then what else, what other tasks can i bin so that i can i can be more efficient with my time um i think that's been the, the biggest thing and now it's super helpful because now some of the thing now that i've been back at work you know working the whole time now there's sometimes where on the weekend or if it's late on a Friday and I, I can start to say, oh, this is a task that I can do at home. Like I can go home and work on this presentation. I can better my, I'm a lot better at identifying when I should do things at home, when I should do things at work and um, when does it not matter? So, mm -hmm. Was it hard managing a work-life balance in the beginning of the pandemic when like you mentioned, everything was done at your desk at home, like work was done at home, home was done at home. <laughs> Yeah, everything was, yeah, absolutely. Everything was done pretty much right here. And you couldn't really um, go out was, or go places. Exactly. It's like, well, if I if I go out, I'm going to be away from my computer. And what if I get an email? Um, and so it, it almost seemed like, I mean, I'm going to give an example of, on a couple occasions, I wanted to go out and get food, bring it home, because I didn't feel like cooking that morning, right? So I would I would debate, you know, what, are, what am I going to lose by going out, getting food, maybe taking 30 minutes and then coming back? Well, well, what might I miss? And if I felt like I was going to miss a significant amount, then I wouldn't do it, right? I would say, okay, that's not going to, that's not a good use of my time, not going to do it. But there were plenty of times where I would have to work, I would find myself working late because during that same 30 minute period, I would still just sit at home and maybe be on my computer, but not being necessarily the most productive uh, research assistant in that moment. And so it's like, well, in the end, I, I'm getting the same, not the same amount done, but I'm not being that much less productive by going to get food and bettering my day and then really just focusing on work for the rest of the day versus eh, 30 minutes of work is really only 20 minutes of work and 10 minutes of doing whatever else. So I think that, that was an interesting um, part to, to now evaluate. Because back then I didn't think any much of it. I was on my computer. I felt like I was out. I was in the presence of work, but I wasn't always doing the work. 
And then there are plenty of things that I felt like I shouldn't do to better my life because I was going to be away from my desk. Mm -hmm. But it's not like I was being, I was always being 100% productive at my desk. Whereas, you know, now going into work, it's like, oh, I can be productive at work for this amount of time and then come home and, and do whatever I, and do what I want and then feel very happy about the work-life balance. Now, I love my work-life balance, but back then it was work, work, life, life, scrambled, <laughs> scrambled up balance. Scrambled egg, so. Yeah. I like that answer, though, because I, I feel the same way sometimes, even working in person where I'm at work, but I feel like I'm not being productive and getting stuff done, but I feel the the expectation and the need to stay, um, just to be there, to be at work. Um, Absolutely. But yeah. So it's been great talking to you. I'm going to wrap up soon. There's just a couple questions I have left. If you were to give advice to yourself from two years ago at the beginning of the pandemic, what would you say? And if you were to give advice to, I don't know, maybe like an old childhood friend that's starting a PhD in the fall, like two years <laughs> later now, uh, what advice would you have for them as well? Uh, that is, those are some great questions. My advice to myself would have been to be more organized, stay on top of, really try to divide my day up on a little bit more of a, I don't want to say micromanage my own self, but definitely come up with a better plan. Um, I was just starting my PhD. There were so many things to read. There were so many things, um, that I didn't know, but, um, just organizing my time a lot better would have allowed me to advance my knowledge a lot sooner. Um, also, on a, on a side note, I feel like now through the pandemic, I've read so many papers that I find myself having to reread a lot of the papers that I read at the beginning of the pandemic. And I'm not sure if that is because it's been two years and I haven't read those articles in a while, or if it's because I didn't really fully understand and grasp the material the first time. Because, I don't know, now when I read papers, I feel very like, oh, I, I could tell you what happened in this paper, their methods, and what came out of it. I'm not sure I could say the same thing about those papers a while back. So I think it sounds basic, but I would just be more organized, um, siphon out my day, be okay taking time to myself when I needed it, but don't just waste parts of the day just to have to work more later. Um, that would be an advice to, to myself. For you, Mike, uh, I, I think my, sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody entering their PhD, um, especially with someone who has so much experience, um, get to know your lab mates, you know, really spend time bonding with them. Um, I think we all have taken for granted the fact that we all just work next to each other. Um, I can't tell you the amount of times during my week where another one of my coworkers will say, oh, look at this presentation. Does, does this look okay? And I, I'm no expert. By all means, I am no expert, but I am another set of eyes. Um, and the same thing for my coworkers. I, the amount of times I've said, I'm struggling with this, uh, with this idea. Can you come in, take a look? Um, and they've helped me so many times. So get to know your coworkers, understand that um, certainly in my PhD, I have not felt competition within my lab mates. I, just, I feel very, um, it feels like a family. Um, and the, these are not people to compete with you. They are people who are, you can learn from and they are people who will learn from you. Um, and so just in, embrace that fact, even the undergrads. Undergrads always have a lot more to give than you, you may expect at first, but they, they are always super helpful sounding boards um, and great sources of information. So yeah, just treat everybody like, Kind of like a family, awesome. a lab family. Got it. Um, awesome, Garrett. Well, thank you for the uh, the advice. Thanks for the insight, the conversation, and thanks for taking the time to be on Boom today. I really appreciate you having me, Mike. Take care. Thanks for listening to Student Voices, a series by Biomechanics on Our Minds by students and for students. If you have an idea for an episode of Student Voices, or if you want to host your own episode, please reach out to us at Biomechanics on our minds at gmail.com or tweet at us at biomechanics OOM. We'd love to hear from you. Let's keep these conversations going. Bye.